Hello lovely people. I recently had a birthday in July and some very lovely people got me some books and then I've just also been buying myself books so I, I just I thought it was about time I did a little check-in and I showed you all of the exciting things that have entered my life recently that I hope to get to quite soon. Sophie vlogs. I'm going to kick off with books that I received for my birthday from some very very kind and lovely human beings. Um, my partner got me two books that I am super duper excited for. The first one of these is Remembering Our Intimacies by Jamaica Yo Limele Le Kalani Osorio. I have been really wanting to read uh, more writing by Pacific Islander writers. Um, it's just an area that I've not explored very much of uh, until the last few years. And uh, this one stood out to me because um, it's described as working at the intersections of Hawaiian knowledge, indigenous queer theory and indigenous feminisms. The author is recuperating native Hawaiian concepts and ethics around relationality, desire and belonging firmly grounded in the land, memory and the body of native Hawaii. Um, this sounds like a book that I've never read anything like before, so I'm really, really excited to dive in. He also got me 40 Lost Years by Rosa Maria Arkimbao, which is translated by Peter Bush. This is another piece of Catalan translated writing. Um, I have like a mini project to read Catalan translated works before I go on holiday to Barcelona, which is hopefully happening in 2024. Um, this is the story of a young seamstress living in Barcelona who experiences the joy of the Second Republic and the crushing blows that fascism dealt to freedom throughout the second half of the 20th century. She goes into exile and then she, when she returns to Barcelona, it's completely transformed. And so she's trying to pick up the pieces after these like 40 lost years of fascist rule. Essentially, I, I did some research into like well-regarded Catalan writers and this was one of the results that came up so I'm just working my way through trying out different writers and seeing how I get on because I like to sort of explore um, writings of places before I go to them as well as reading some while I'm there just to like really aid my like understanding of the place that I am journeying to. So I'm um, hoping to read that ahead of that visit. Not that I know when that visit is happening, so that gives me wiggle room. <laughs> uh, my very kind friend Alona got me Tell Me Pleasant Things About Immortality by Lindsay Wong. Um, this is a short story collection. She gave it to me because she has two copies, but also I do love mushrooms. And she was like, this cover seems perfect for you. But these are described as a wild and darkly hilarious collection of immigrant horror stories. Um, I don't read a lot of horror, but I'm super intrigued by that little description. So I'm going to give it a go and see how I get on. Um, Mark, who I just, I no longer introduce Mark as my friend. I'm like, podcast co-host, BFF. Uh, if you watch this channel, I talk about Mark all the time. He knows my reading tastes very well, which is shown by the fact that he got me Gwen and Arthur Not in Love by Lex Croucher, because this book has been comped to A Knight's Tale, which is one of my favourite films of all time. So this is set in a world in which Arthur and Guinevere were real. This is like many generations later, people are constantly like named after the Knights of the Round Table and everything. And it's kind of like a, a queer fake dating love story kind of thing, because like these guys are betrothed to each other, but like she's interested in her and he's interested in him and that kind of thing. I've read Infamous by Lex Croucher. It was a really fun time. I think that this will be even more my jam because I'm very much like give me a romantic comedy set in a Camelot infused world. Yes please. Super hyped for that. Um, and he also got me A Fighting Man of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, which is a John Carter book because he's been reading the John Carter series and sending me messages and we've been somewhat taking the piss out of it a little bit. <laughs> but also these are very like seminal, foundational, like sci-fi texts. So this is one that I should be able to go into without having read any of the other John Carters, I believe. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to experience it for myself. We have created a running joke whereby because Martians lay eggs and are red, uh, Martians are Birdo, so gonna have to try and get that out of my head before going in. And then my dad did his traditional um, classic comic buying where he just gets me comics that are like considered like iconic that he thinks that I might like. Lately he's been working his way through some of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen comics by Alan Moore. So I have um, The Black Dossier which is the book that immediately comes after the second volume which is the last one that he bought me last birthday. And then this series, which are the century ones. So it's 1910 
1969 and then 2009. I'm intrigued with these because I, I like the different like art styles and I'm intrigued to see like what's going to be happening there with sort of like the historical time routing. I don't know. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is one that I have often have mixed feelings of so I'm I'm intrigued but also they're never like my favorites but I do enjoy this like exploration of like groundbreaking comics that were really influential in their time and that kind of thing um, and then they also got me this little book which is called Elemental Magic by Anne Stokes and John Woodward. Anne Stokes is a fantasy artist that my stepmom really really loves. This is just like a little compendium that has lots of Anne Stokes's artwork and stuff in it like this is one of the fire people stuff like that so I haven't dived into this yet but I think it'll be a fun little read. I will confess that I have been doing some book buying as sort of like a birthday thing um, that I, I sort of jumped off of the birthday celebrations and treated myself to a few things. One of which is I really like collecting the Agatha Christie crime collection. That is these books here. Let me show you. They have this lovely cover. They're three books in one and that feels like a great deal to me. Um, they have little like sprayed red edges on the top. Um, I just think they're lovely. I got these, this set of three, which is technically nine books, in uh, an Opsarm charity shop for super duper cheap. And um, I've been keeping an eye out for more and this person was selling a, a, a bulk of them for quite a reasonable price to be fair to you. These weren't like horrendously expensive, particularly as it now means I have 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 Agatha Christie's! <laughs> wow! Um, the only thing I will say, so I got this little bundle of them. I hate the dust jackets. I think these are so ugly. I dislike them so strongly and then you take them off and it's like oh hello absolutely beautiful I don't understand why this bit exists but um I I'm gonna take the dust jackets off of all of them but included in this is Parola Enhouse, The Body in the Library, Hercule Poirot's Christmas, The Pale Horse, The Big Four, The Secret Adversary, Nemesis, Parker Pine Investigates, Poirot Investigates, By the Pricking of My Thumbs, The Mysterious Mr. Quinn, Endless Night, A Caribbean Mystery, Taken at the Flood, and The Seven Dials Mystery. I have read about three of these, so this is pretty much a whole chunk of Agatha Christie that I've not read before. I would be very interested if you are an Agatha Christie aficionado, which ones of those would be good ones to prioritise, because I'm not reading them in any particular order, I'm just diving in whenever I fancy an Agatha Christie, to be honest with you. Oof. Hello, editing Sophie is interrupting because I don't know why I recorded this before I had my final birthday meet up, because I got given a little set of books. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't think that this would happen. So I just briefly interrupting to say that my lovely darling mum got me a matching set of my favourite editions of the Tiffany A. King series, um, which is very sneaky of her because I took her to my favourite bookshop, which is Mr. B's Emporium in Bath, which is a wonderful bookshop. And if you're ever in the area, I'd really recommend it. And I pointed to these books and I said, Oh, these editions are amazing. I covet these. And she filed it away in her little brain. Um, and I feel very touched. It was my 30th birthday. Because <laughs> I haven't banged on about that enough. So um, to get like a, a little set that is um, beautiful and something I will treasure feels very special to me. So I just wanted to show you. So the Tiffany Aching series is a uh, part of the Discworld. Um, it is a, a YA series that is about Tiffany, who is a witch who grows up on the chalk and um, her, her journey in becoming a witch and the trials and tribulations. She's aided by these beings called the Nakmak Beagles. They are not pixies. They do not appreciate being called pixies. Um, it's just very beautiful. It's a really special series. It's my favourite. I have other favourites in the Discworld universe, but the Tiffany Aching ones were the first ones when I was younger and I was properly starting to read the Discworld series for myself that actually, like, I really engaged with. So we have The We Free Men as the first book, Half of Sky, which I have just uh, reread on audiobook, uh, Wintersmith, which uh, was going to be my next one, so I'm excited to be able to read that myself. Um, I Shall Wear Midnight, which is up there with my faves of the series, and then The Shepherd's Crown, which is actually the final book that uh, Pratchett was writing when he passed away. So this was sort of unfinished, and then it was finished in order to be published. Um, so yes, 
past Sophie will pick up from here. I went to Manchester in June to see my partner's favourite band, Mars Volta, and um, we visited a uh, Blackwells, which had a very good sale on some of its ha hardback books, and I was incapable of resisting. First up is The Dark Queens by Shelley Puhak, which is about the Merovingian uh, Queen Brunhild, who was a Visigothic princess, and um, her sister-in-law, Fredegund, um, so these two queens commanded armies, developed taxation policies, established infrastructure and negotiated with emperors and popes, all the time fighting a gruelling 40-year civil war with each other. I don't know anything about these women and I am super excited to learn more. This cover, I have to say, I have a real soft spot for and I've, it's been on my radar for a while so I just absolutely swept in and picked it up. I could not resist. Um, at the same time, I got All's Well by Mona Awad. Which, because I've been, I haven't read Bunny, I've heard mixed things about Bunny, but I think that this sounds super duper interesting. It's Shakespearean inspired, and um, it is someone who is determined to put on Shakespeare's All's Well That Ends Well, but the cast is hell-bent on staging Macbeth, and she meets three strange benefactors who have an eerie knowledge of, the woman is called Miranda, of Miranda's past, um, and I just... I think this it's described as the story of a woman at her breaking point and a formidable, a formidable, piercingly funny indictment of our collective refusal to witness and believe female pain. That combination of like Shakespearean stuff, shenanigans happening, it seems like a bit dark. I'm super duper intrigued by this. I don't know how I will fall on it, but I, I'm, I'm very intrigued to dive in. Um, and I also got Rainbow Rainbow by Lydia Con Conklin, which is a collection of short stories. Um, I became aware of this because Bao's books on Instagram, I think she's changed her Instagram handle recently. Either way, I'll put down below because um, not only does she do really interesting book recs, but she does outfits inspired by books. And she did like an eye makeup look inspired by this book that I thought was really cool. And then that made me read the blurb and I realised that it's like short... It's a short story collection full of queer, trans and gender non-conforming characters who are seeking love and connection in hilarious and heartrending stories that reflect the complexity of our current movement. And I think that that sounds super duper intriguing. Um, and then the final one I bought in Blackwells was just uh, Blind Spot, Exploring and Educating on Blindness by Maud Rowell. I read um, the I read Liam Coneman's book in from this series in June for Pride Reading Month, which was uh, the appendix, which is like transmasculine joy in a transphobic culture. And I really, really enjoyed that. When I was in Manchester at the People's History Museum, I went to, they had an exhibition there that was all about disability rights and the disability rights movement. And it was brilliant. I thought it was excellent. Would highly recommend it's on for a while if you are in Manchester and haven't been super duper, definitely go. And this is a book that has been on my radar to read for a while, but because of doing that exhibition, I thought that this would be a really great one. I, I never see these in bookshops. Maybe I'm not going to the right bookshops, but they had the whole series in Blackwells. And I was like, this is the one I'm going to get because of that exhibition. I then want to get a better insight into what it is like to navigate our society as a blind person. Um, I also went to one of my favourite bookshops, which is based in Manchester, which is called Queer Lit. I order from them online all the time, but this is my first time actually visiting them in person. And I, I was like, I have to support you now that I'm here. So I picked up Camp, The Story of the Attitude That Conquered the World by Paul Baker, which is all about the concept of camp. I have really enjoyed Paul Baker's other books, Fabulosa, which is all about the Polari language, and then Outrageous, which is all about uh, Section 28 and its repeal in the UK. Um, that one was a five star read for me, and I literally read it in June, and I had just read it where we went to Manchester, so I was like, this has to come home with me. My friend Georgie was doing like a little bit of a book clear out, this was a while ago now, but I blagged from her The Penultimate Truth by Philip K. Dick, which is uh, World War Three is raging or so. The millions of people crammed in their underground tanks believe. People are existing in like underground tanks, but um, the story that they are being told about what is happening in the world, it does not reflect what is actually really going on. I have sometimes had a mixed bag with Philip K. Dick. I think his work adapts really well. Adaptations of his ideas are always super duper cool. And then I read his books and sometimes I'm like, it's not hitting for me, Philip. It's not doing it. Uh, I really like The Maze of Death. That one was great. But other ones have given me a bit mixed feelings. But 
uh, Georgie was getting rid of books, so I dove on it. I will also link down below uh, said friend Georgie does. Um, she's very into dystopian and sci-fi and that kind of stuff. And she has an Instagram where she does little uh, dystopian book reviews. So I'll link that down below if you are a fellow dystopian reader. I'd really recommend. I mentioned that I've got books through my works charity stuff a few times. We're partnered with uh, charity, so we do regular like fundraising for them. And one we did recently was a tombola. And I got Idol by Louise O'Neill. I've not read any Louise O'Neill, but no. That she's like the hot stuff on YouTube. This is about someone who is an influencer who sort of like speaks her truth about this like sexual awakening that she had with this female friend and then uh, she gets really really great feedback from it online but then this friend contacts her to be like that's not how I remember it. She actually remembers it as a much darker experience and um, so I think that's gonna be hopefully a very I'm hoping for like an interesting and nuanced look at what it means to be an influencer. I'm trusting Louise O'Neill to do that and to not just present like, ooh, influencer's bad. I want more of like a complex look at that like um, break between like you as a human and then reality. And I don't know, I, I want something, I want something delicious, not just like, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. I have like two more like themed moments and then I will just tell you about the rest of the random books that I just pick up on whims. Pretty much nearly nearly all of these are from charity shops because I go in and then I see things and I'm like, oh, you're on my list. And then I, I must, simply must get them. Um, this little win are uh, Welsh books or books where authors are Welsh or stuff like that to do with Wales because I'm constantly building next year's Dewey-thon TBR list every year. Um, for this one, I have Sarah Waters. This one's The Little Stranger. Didn't love the last Sarah Waters that I read, but I've heard much better things about this um, which is um, about a, a crumbling mansion house, a mother, son and daughter who are struggling to keep pace with a changing society. Are they haunted by something more sinister than a dying way of life? Um, I'm intrigued. I'm hoping that I will like this one a lot more than the last one. Um, another one of my standard Deweython authors is Jasper Ford. This is the second book in the Tuesday Next series, uh, which is uh, very funny, very humorous, but also has a really interesting sort of like world building political setup. It's a world that's very influenced by um, books and authors and that kind of thing. Our protagonist, Thursday Next, has some uh, interesting skills and stuff that lend themselves to investigating like literature related crime. We also picked up Welsh Food Stories by Carwin Graves. I love a food writing. This is specifically all about um, looking at little stories to do with particular Welsh food. Like they talk to the people who make Halon Mon, which is uh, sea salt, which is made on Innes Mon, which I love. <laughs> but also just like. Uh, looking at just like national cuisine and keeping local food alive and that kind of thing. It was a pound and I was like, yes, you're coming with me. Um, then I also have uh, Telling Tales by Patience Agabi, which is, this is, this sounds super interesting because it is a 21st century remix of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. And like, I didn't need to know anything other than that. I thought that sounded fabulous. So this one, can I even wait for Dewey-thon for it? I don't know, I'm super excited about it. Um, and then the final one of my like Wales books is The History of Wales in Twelve Poems by M. Wynne Thomas with illustrations by Ruth Jen Evans. This is a curated set of 12 poems from different points in Welsh history by different writers and then they have these beautiful illustrations accompanying them. A couple of them like like the Godothin and stuff like this like I have read but most of them I haven't so I'm really excited to introduce myself to some authors that I've not read before. Um, and then the final category is slightly weird books because I'm, I'm in a bit of a mood for some things that are doing some strange things. So first of those is Viper Wine by Hermione Eyre. This is um, set in 17th century London. Our main character, Venetia Stanley, inspires poetry by Ben, ben Johnson, paintings by Van Dyck and adoration from the Massids. But um, she, her husband is a philosopher, alchemist and time traveller and she has an elixir of youth and it's set on the eve of English Civil War and it's like, what is the cost of beauty? I have heard mixed things, but I'm hoping that it will be like the type of weird historical meshing that really works for me. Another one that's sort of like meshing historical stuff together is The End of Night Work by Aidan Cottrell Boyce, where we follow someone who, um, he ages strangely, so he's 30, but he looks like he's 13 and he is obsessed with 
a uh, the writings of an obscure 17th century Puritan prophet and his premonitions of ecological disaster and the end of the world. Um, and then he meets a radical movement who is arguing that all economic and political events are part of an aeon long struggle between the old and the young. I think that this is doing very strange things and I'm really interested to see if I love it or if I hate it, but I think it's going to be like a really memorable read. Um, and then finally, I don't know how weird this one is, but this is Wicked As You Wish by Rinch Pecco, which is kind of drawing on Arthurian myth. Um, yes, so Avalon was left desolate and encased in ice when the evil Snow Queen raged war against the powerful country. Its protectors are now stuck in Arizona. And so they reunite with a ragtag group to go and like save this place. Um, I love Arthurian stuff. I'm hoping that that works really well for me. I will go on to the very final run of it books now. I'm sorry, this is taking a really long time. Um, I picked up Black Marks on the White Page by Witty Imhera and Tina Maharetti. This is a collection of oceanic writers uh, for the 21st century. So um, as I have mentioned earlier, I'm interested in reading more works that are from people who live on the various Pacific islands and that kind of stuff. And that kind of stuff. Uh, I like picking up collections and then seeing which stories work for me and then going off and exploring those authors further. Um, I have Certain Dark Things by Silvia Moreno Garcia, who is a writer who I really enjoy. This is a uh, vampire story that is uh, drawing on Aztec mythology, and that in itself was enough to sell me on it. Um, Briefly A Delicious Life by Nell Stevens is one that I've heard wonderful things about and I'm super duper interested in it. It follows Blanca who has been dead for centuries when she falls in love with celebrated novelist George Sand and um, but then also George has come to the island of Mallorca with her ailing lover Frédéric Chopin and um, the teenage ghost is like trying to keep them from disaster. If that's not a concept that I want to explore I don't know what is. Um, when I Sing Mountains Dance by Irene Sola is um, set high in the mountains. This guy is struck by lightning while he's out foraging. It's like the mountain, this, this is what got me. It belong, the mountain, it, the land is not theirs. It belongs to those who have long called the mountain their home. Chanterelle mushrooms and roe deer, the ghosts of Spain's civil war and the clouds that top these perilous climbs. Um, so it's, it's, an, it's an imaginative elemental story of love and loss um, and a giddy paean to the land in all its interconnectedness. I just keep finding books that are like sound too amazing to just not pick up. Um, another one of those is Super Infinite by Catherine Rundle. This is all about John Donne, um, who is a figure that I, I have read his poetry, but I don't know too much about him. A scholar of law, a sea adventurer, an MP, a priest, the dean of St Paul's Cathedral, and perhaps the greatest love poet in the history of the English language. This is just exploring his mind, and I'm super excited to get to know that better. Um, I have also got Maria Devana Headley's translation of Beowulf. This is supposed to be doing some really interesting stuff with Beowulf, like using a lot more contemporary language. And then also it's supposed to, I think it's been billed as quite like a feminist version of it. Um, obviously it's a translation, it's not a reworking, so it will be sticking to the, um, the story. But I think language choice with translation is always something that's so interesting. And this was, uh, I know, I knew about this because she starts it with, bro, tell me we still know how to speak of kings. And I was like, I'm sold, I'm sold. Um, I also have Light from Uncommon Stars by Rika Aoki. This is um, about someone who's made a deal with the devil to escape damnation. She must entice seven other violin prodigies to trade their souls for success. And she has delivered six, but she um, comes across this person who is a young transgender runaway and she can, she feels like she's found her final candidate, but she just can't do it. Um, heard nothing but glowing stuff for that. Uh, I picked up Adrian Rich's Poetry and Prose, which is a Norton Critical Edition. I got this uh, in a charity shop and they said that the person who owned it before was a university lecturer at Bristol University and it's just filled absolutely to the brim with scribbled notations. Adrian Rich is like a, uh, I know she's very famous in like lesbian poet circles and she's someone who I've been wanting to explore for a while and I was like with the benefit of someone of like an actual lecturer's scribbled notes on it, yes please. And then finally, two little books which I put on to fill up a uh, Waterstones order once to get one of those £10 stampy dobs are um, Jared Manley Hopkins as Kingfisher's Catch Fire. I've never read any of his poetry, but I thought the title sounded really evocative. And Food by Gertrude Stein, because I will always read food writing because I always want to love it. 
that's everything. Boy howdy, she's been buying books hasn't she? I would love 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 to hear your thoughts on any of these, please do let me know. I will let you go because this video is probably quite long and I hope you have a lovely day and I'll see you next time for something different.